welcome to Somerville Media Center Live. I'm Joe Lynch. This is the Somerville School Committee and Superintendent's Office update for June 17th, 2020. I'm Joe Lynch again. My guest joining me for another episode is School Committee Chair Carrie Norman. And joining us today as well is Assistant Superintendent Chad Mazza. To both of you, welcome back. Welcome to Chad for the first time. Carrie, how you doing? I haven't seen you in two weeks. What have you been up to? Uh, last week was a beautiful, I spent two full days at Dilboy watching the Somerville High School and the Full Circle graduations and I'm actually going to cry. Uh, it was uh, it was an elaborate and orchestrated process. I, I cannot say enough about the rec department and the, uh, I think Jill Lathan has missed her calling. I think she should work for FEMA, the organization and the joy of seeing kids and families get to walk across the stage. It was something else. And there were some kids that I've known since kindergarten, some that I, if you asked me a couple months ago, I wasn't sure if they were gonna make it and to be able to celebrate them in person. Uh, the only snafu was we had a brief thunderstorm and we worked our way through it. I have never seen a team effort between uh, the police that were there, the rec department, the school staff. It was truly a phenomenal event. You know, something tells me based on that intro, Carrie, and Chad's gonna give us a little bit of update. Um, I think, this is going to be a beautiful, good, feel, feel good story today from the superintendent's office and from the school committee. Chad, welcome. I've seen your face on television many times before. How are you doing? How's, how are you and the family doing? We're doing pretty well. I mean, it's a, you know, we have a, a four year old son. Oh, he just turned four. He'll be starting in the SMILE program uh, in the fall. So we're trying to transition him into, he's kind of tired of us at this point because he's been with us all day, every day since March, um, but we're, we're doing well. I mean, I spent the last couple of weeks work-wise uh, on virtual graduations when we go up ceremonies. And I can tell you that all schools, all principals, all learning communities really celebrated kids in a way that you couldn't necessarily celebrate in person. They were well thought out, not that they weren't in person, but they were well thought out. There was more engagement and to see students at home and their families celebrating in the excitement. It's just, I, I literally, during one of the uh, presentations, I cried because it was just so well done and, and so moving. Well, a lot of the credit, and, and I would say, goes to the students for accepting what they had to do, the parents for guiding them through it, the entire education system, including the superintendent's office, city back office city people like Jill Latham and for the school committee um, I think it will be one graduation that none of those kids will ever forget so Correct. you know thank you so much for making it work for them and we had a very small part the, the media center with assisting with some of the other move on programs but I've heard from parents and students who participated in the graduation and they were over the moon that's so we wonderful. have another, we have another, I'm sorry, Carrie. I was just going to say uh, it, it was truly moving. And, and while it was not the graduation we had planned, uh, each student had a real moment and they were, we spaced it out that families could take photos with them. It was very special. There's one more um, move up ceremony tonight. It's the scale graduation. It's at seven tonight. Unfortunately, yes. it conflicts with the, the school committee's uh, public hearing on the budget tonight, and I will not steal Scales Thunder, but they have a phenomenal guest. That's true. Yes. Absolutely terrific. So Chad, I wanna start with you if we could. Sure. You are um, assistant superintendent working with uh, Mary Skipper, mm -hmm. and your kind of forte is curriculum, um, instruction, and assessment. But yes. uh, Carrie's intro to me, of you was, and he does so much more. So I wanna give you a little bit, a little bit of time to explain, you know, what the role is for curriculum instruction and assessment. Take it away. Sure, sure. So one of the, the exciting things I get to do is I get to work with all the schools on curricular based programs. I get to work with school leadership teams, school principals, um, the district leadership team 
to really develop both curriculum and professional development um, to be provided to all staff. So it, it starts with a lot of planning, um, but probably my favorite part of this job is being able to go and visit all the schools and see all the wonderful things that are happening for students with educators basically on a daily basis. You know, I had been a principal at Winter Hill for seven years. And when you're in a school, you're kind of in a silo. And I always knew that there were a lot of great things happening in the district, but boy, I'll tell you what, you know, up until March, I was in schools every day, just seeing the incredible work that was being done, seeing the care that was being given to students, looking at students and watching them grow both socially, emotionally, and academically. That by far is the best part of my job. I also have a lot of things to do with all the assessments with MCAS, with our interim assessments, um, our formative assessments that we give throughout the course of the year. But by far being in schools, interacting with adults and, and children is amazing. I mean, because I had been a principal for 14 years, this was the first year that I didn't open a school. So it was a little different for me, but the one saving grace is we had the high school CTE program at Edgerly. So we had kids in the building. So it kind of saved me emotionally on day one because it was such a different feel for me. Chad, we've never met, but your reputation precedes you because we both know somebody in common who you worked with for many, many years at Winter Hill. And Linda Walsh has nothing but praise for you. Oh, well, thank you. I, Linda's a phenomenal educator and an even better person, honestly. I, I, you know, and I've only known her for a short period of time, but I'll tell you what, she really is the epitome of who you want educating our children and well, who you want mentoring our new teachers. And I think we have a lot of phenomenal teachers. And, you know, Linda once said to me, if you neglect mentioning me on any of your shows, I'll <laughs> regret it. So there's, there was the plug for one of Shameless the, plug. <laughs> that was a shameless plug for a good friend. Chad, let's yes. talk about how the curriculum was upset during COVID, the reaction that you folks had, and then maybe what you're planning on the summer and into the fall. Sure. And, so and Carrie, I'm sorry, Chad. Carrie, okay. if you want to chime in, chime in. Thank you. So I, you know, to this day, I still remember March 10th, we were sitting in a finance and facilities meeting in the conference room at Edgerly. Superintendent Skipper walked out because she had a phone call from the mayor. She walked back in and said, okay, we're going to be closed as a district for the next two days. And we have not been back since. So when that happened, we knew that we had to change our course of, of action for students. One of the first things we did is we created a resource learning page for students while we were trying to develop curriculum for remote learning because we had a feeling we were going to be out for a lot longer. But we also wanted to make sure that our families and our staff were well taken care of, were healthy, and if they needed anything, from a personal standpoint, we would get that for them. So we kind of tackled it from two different perspectives. It was the, the health and well-being of staff, students, and families, and then you know the curriculum side. But we started with the health and well-being of everybody because that to us is the number one thing as we move forward. So as the shutdown continued, we knew we had to create a remote learning, one a website for people to access, but create lessons by teachers for students so they would have interaction with their kids. Um, we did it both synchronously and asynchronously um, because we wanted to make sure that students had FaceTime with their teachers, especially at the younger grades, because that FaceTime is so important in those conversations and just seeing their teachers is such an important piece of the developmental process, you wanted to make sure that that was happening. Um, at the middle school level, it was a combination of both, um, but we were trying to maintain as much of the integrity of what we had done in the classroom as we could, knowing that you can't replicate what happens on a daily basis in the classroom in a remote learning environment. But our goal was to make it as close as we could to what students would get. Now, the entire time we were troubleshooting what would happen. Um, we wanted to make sure that all families had access to the internet. Dr. Jeff Curley, who was the chief of staff, did a phenomenal job working with Comcast to make sure all of our families were able to get access, number one, which it was really a great thing to watch because you wanted to make sure it was equitable for everybody, um, which took probably at least a month 
to get that up and going. But he did a great job working with Comcast. So that way families at least had the access. And then it was trying to figure out how we get them actively engaged in the learning process at home. We initially sent home paper packets while we were getting things in order so students would be able to work on skills um, that they needed to work on. But we also wanted to make sure that we were reviewing skills that were previously taught up to March 10th when everything kind of shut down. The state came out with guidance of doing a lot of review, but we also wanted to make sure we were teaching to standards that were going to prepare kids for the next grade because we wanna make sure that they have those skill sets. So when we go back to school and I'll get to what we think it might look like in the fall, they were prepared for that. I, I will say, you know, it, it hasn't been easy. Educators have been working very hard, working closely with families to make sure that students are engaged as much as possible. But it's also uh, was a big burden on families as well because families were now also being caregivers, educators, and trying to balance jobs of their own which we know isn't necessarily the easiest thing to do. So it was trying to find that balance with families so that students could access what they needed to for about three hours a day, according to the state guidance, but then still being able to keep the integrity of parents working and getting done what they needed to to provide for their families. Um, I, I will say that, you know, I was so impressed with the collaboration that did happen. Um, it, it's not to say there weren't some bumps in the road, but that's expected but I think we were very, very responsive when things weren't working the way that they were supposed to be so that students were getting and families were getting what they needed. Um, we also provided over a thousand Chromebooks uh, to students to make sure that they could ask, access things online um, because a lot of families didn't have, ac one didn't have access, but didn't have a means to access what they needed to. So we made sure we, we distributed about a thousand throughout the district. And then in K to two, we, we bought some Amazon Fires for the kids that had limited access to things, but gave them the ability to do what they needed to do academically and socially with the device. But um, Chad, Chad let, yes. me ask you, let me ask you a question on that. Sure. So the school district and you know, multi-agencies were working hard to try to get kids access to the internet if they didn't yeah. already have it at home and to give them that device to access the internet. How difficult, and this is purely me asking this question, how sure. difficult or easy was it for a lot of the students to adapt to using the device? Forget about their attentive span or whether or not they were doing it. My assumption, watching my own grand nieces and nephews, is that those devices, intuitively, they know how to use them. Right, they, they do, but I think it was, it was much easier for I would say probably grades four to eight or four to 12 to access what they needed to. I think we ran into some difficulties with our pre-K, K to two and three students with trying to get on multiple platforms, trying to sign in at different points during the day because a lot of things that they needed to do to gain access, they needed a parent to help them, Got sign it. them in. Yeah. So, you know, we, we know now that as we move forward, a remote platform for pre-K to two does not necessarily work. Um, so as we move into planning for the fall, we know that that's an issue that we need to deal with. Whether it's we bring all those groups back to school in some capacity live, um, but we know that the remote piece just does not work. So we're not going to replicate that because it would just be more of the same and students and families wouldn't be getting what they need. And there's the challenge with that age group, Chad, I think, is they are very high touch humans. Correct. Uh, yeah, yeah. Correct. Well, well uh, bless you now. I mean, if you can figure that one out and the educators can figure that one out. Let me go over to Carrie for one second, Chad, sure. if you don't mind. Carrie, you've had kids that have gone through the public school system. Yeah. Um, you have kids that are still under education, wh whether it's college or whatever. Well, I have one at the high school. Yep. And at the high school. So here's the question from a parent's standpoint. You were handed over responsibility for your child's education versus what's been happening all these years is that you entrust the education system right. to take care of them on the school day. How difficult, from not only from your standpoint, but for the vast majority of parents, 
I don't, being an, uh, I'm not a parent, so I can only understand from the standpoint of other people telling me stories, but real right. quickly, Carrie, how difficult is that? Having children at home trying to learn at the same time mom's trying to work. Uh, it is difficult. I was in uh, office hours last night with CPAC and I had to mute myself to be, to go be a mom for a couple moments and then come back. Uh, and, and, and if you've got younger kids, it, that's much more intense consistent responsibility. Uh, it is hard. What was hard for us at the high school age is um, there's a lot more independent work and for better or for worse, uh, I am not going to college with my kids and I, I believe very strongly that uh, they need to take responsibility. Uh, that said, they were needed a lot more support. What, what we struggled with is um, some of the classes didn't have specific meeting times so you would you could drop in if you were uh, struggling, and I can tell you, if, uh, at least my teenager was not opting to st stop in that often. Um, and I think we we learned a lot. I it's been incredible that any it, to me in some ways that anything got done because we were all living with such uncertainty. We still are. We still have a health crisis going on even as we reopen. Um, it was. And I'll be honest, and I, I think I speak for a lot of parents, is sometimes you have to pick your battles. And sometimes you have to say, uh, that's good enough because today was just a hard day for all kinds of reasons and, and you make peace with that. I, I, I mean, I have a sophomore, so it's he's got more time to get caught up before he moves on. I, the seniors handled it with such grace I, and maturity. I, I, I really, can't say enough, but I also am concerned about our current juniors rising seniors because they have had this learning loss and we can't say for sure what next year will look like. Um, but from a parent standpoint, Carrie, I think this is a very, very valuable lesson to all of those parents who, you know, your their child would leave at quarter of eight or 7.30 in the morning oh. and they wouldn't see them again until 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon and could never understand some of yeah. the issues that teachers had with their child. Oh, 100%. Uh, that, well, the that, other... that is now front and center in their face, is that this is what it's like. It's For sure. To, I, I to... think there is an incredible uh, deep, deeper appreciation of our educators and everyone that, all the adults that our kids encounter in schools, whether it's in the cafeteria, at the front desk, uh, for sure. Uh, what I also know is I think I was always first confused and now I appreciate the disconnect when I would go to parent teacher night and I would hear about this angel that was at school <laughs> and and then I would come home you know the kid who comes in the door at four who's hungry and tired and cranky frankly so it's uh, our kids do better I, I, I really do think that the culture at school and the expectations and being away from your family, you, kids are going to behave differently, right? And, of course, and they do, and they do much better around their peers. Oh, a hundred percent. Kids are lonely. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So let me let me jump back over to Chad. Chad, for the summer, yeah. yep. what is the what, what does it look like that? Do we have anything that we're going to be offering to the kids during the summer? We do. We do. It's it's scaled back quite a bit because we can't be in buildings. Um, but we have a uh, special education summer school that, and, and, and our main goal with the summer school this year is to try to do as much one-to-one -one or really, really small group work with educators. Um, so we have our spell program for our language learners. We also have one-to-one -one tutoring in both math and ELA that our uh, curriculum director, Ori Harrell, is uh, facilitating, which is something that is, is different than we've had in the past. Um, you know, we have community schools that is still running. Um, and we also have Greater Breakthrough Boston, which, you know, is running a hybrid program. It's, it, it's usually six weeks. It's scaled back to four. Everything is virtual. But there are aspects of, of schooling that we still have for students. And we're targeting specific students for each of these programs. For example, for our one-to-one uh, -one tutoring in, in ELA, it's students in grade two who have worked with a reading teacher. So we're working on specific skills with kids to prepare them to move up. Um, but if I could jump back just for one second to talk about, you know, when I was listening to Carrie talk from a parent perspective, one of the things we stress with everybody is we have to be flexible. 
there has to be flexibility within the school day to make sure we can reach as many families as possible and we can engage as many as possible. So what teachers were doing, which a lot of people didn't realize is they might have a meeting in the morning, yeah. but then they would have a meeting at five o'clock to make sure they could get all students in their classrooms and families involved in what was happening. You know, there was a lot of behind the scenes work that was happening with planning with educators, planning with coaches, planning with paraprofessionals and principals around what really needs to happen for students. And, and one of the main focus areas for us was engagement. So we had an engagement tracker in each building for lack of a better term. And we would look to see how often students were engaged during the week. Students that were fully engaged, we said, hi, you're fine. Students that were partially engaged, we had a set of criteria where we'd have a, a counselor reach out to see if they needed any support if something was, you know, they needed assistance with. And then we would have students that weren't engaged for whatever reason. And there was no judgment if they weren't engaged. But we need to needed to know why students weren't engaged. So, and we put them with our student support teams. So there was a lot of outreach that was happening. There were home visits that were happening with our um, director of student services and her, her staff to make sure that students and families were okay if we hadn't heard from them in a week or two weeks. It, it was more like a wellness check to make sure that, you know, we want to make sure you're okay. The learning is second. We want to make sure that you're all right because we haven't heard from you in a couple of weeks. And I think- I'll, Chad, Chad yeah. let me ask you a question and you don't, you don't have to answer it if it's too sensitive, but you know, at the beginning of this, I, I had friends who were working in Boston and they moved. They just got up and they went back home to the parents' house. Did we have any examples of where whole families just left Somerville mm -hmm. and went someplace else? I don't recall any, to be honest with you. Um, none that we know of anyway. Okay. Um, that may change this fall, um, but we're not, you know, there really wasn't any movement in that capacity for okay. us. Okay. Sorry. Go, go ahead. No, um, no, no, that's fine. Summertime um, but, learning. Yeah. 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 No, but again, it was, it was about engagement and making sure students and families, we had access to them and there was communication at least on a weekly basis to make sure that things were okay. And if they needed something, they needed food, they needed support, community outreach, we would get them or connect them with whatever they needed to have. Because that for us is, is center and key to, to who we are as a district. So, so I think what's gonna happen is you've taken a lot of the lessons from the abrupt shutdown in how to adapt and turn very quickly, the stuff that you are formulating for the summer. And mm -hmm. then um, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna let too long because we wanna talk about the budget and what's gonna happen. Sure. But for the fall, you're gonna be taking a lot of blended approach, I assume. You're gonna be doing some stuff virtual. You're gonna to try to figure out who to bring back into the buildings safely. And you're gonna be working with staff to try to accomplish all of that. Correct, so we have, we're in the process of creating cross-sectional teams to develop what that looks like um, at the classroom level, at the district level, from a health and wellness perspective, social and emotional perspective, food services, all of those things. And, and one of the last things I will say is we put out surveys to staff, to students and to families because we need to know what works and what doesn't work. And we're, we're starting to get that data to come in and we're gonna be analyzing that to really shift what we need to shift in order to be more effective in what we do and how we approach you know, remote learning. So we, we do value input, we do value feedback. And, and I think that's an important piece and I know school committee does as well. So is it fair to say, I'm, I'm gonna try to jump ahead because I have a lot of parents who live, my neighbors and they have kids in the system. Is it fair to say that when the kids re-engage in September, mm -hmm. it is gonna look a hell of a lot different than it looked like in March when they left? Absolutely. We're yeah. gonna be online learning. There may be opportunities to bring some kids back into some facilities right. under strict safety protocols. But the learning process with its abrupt halt is gonna look a lot different when it goes back in September. Correct, yet it's, it, we, we don't really have a choice. Um, and I think that's why we put the focus on our super standards of what would prepare students for that next grade level when they come back, just for that that's very true. reason. Yeah, I mean, the expectations, you know, I think everyone, between the school committee and, and the superintendent's office and you know folks that I talk to, 
I think everyone is on board with that. They do understand that, you know, come after Labor Day, the doors aren't going to suddenly open and everybody's back in giving three right. more high fives. So, uh, you know, kudos to the superintendent's office, to everybody who's working on this. It is a Herculean effort when you are trying to get kids back engaged in the education system. Carrie, I want to go into one more thing because we've got about three minutes left. You have a, a you and Chad and the superintendent's office have a spectacular announcement about the budget for the school committee. Thank you. So tonight is our public hearing uh, and the, the superintendent will present the entire budget. Um, at, in this very uncertain time, I am proud to say that we have kept the, the focus on students. We have been able to preserve uh, almost all jobs. Uh, I think it's seven point something that we have cut, which uh, if you look We're around at our- Seven point something. Some positions. positions, I'm yeah. sorry. So it's, uh, yes, we've had to, there are things that we are putting off, but we are, we are not cutting in direct student services. I would say, you know, we've, we were able to settle, settle the contract with the parents to give them uh, a, a living wage. And we have also added family liaisons to full time. So we've been adding things that, that, that staff that work directly with students. Um, and preserving as much of that as possible. And it has been with a laser focus. We have gone through this budget, the superintendent and our finance director and all the staff and the principals have been um, very flexible. I mean, where we were two months ago, you know, is it at 7% we need to cut? Are we at level service? We didn't know. And there were many, many, many iterations. Uh, you know, Chad had mentioned the invisible work of educators. That is absolutely true because we've had to, make up so much of this but also in this never-ending changing situation is constant work and it is invisible because it's nothing if there isn't an end product where this this situation is going to continue to evolve and evolve um so certainly it, through next year it, it may be fascinating to see this new mode of education when we move forward um but kudos once again you know if if all is successful tonight between the superintendent's office in trying to work with the school committee and fashion a budget that is solely concentrated on education of the kids and is not becoming a political fight between unions and activists and teachers and non-union <laughs> folks. It appears as though what's happened is that this has come out looking good for the kids. It, it is it is good. It is certainly much better than you know. We had to hit pause on a number of things, um, and we've been able to move forward in a way that uh, I think is true to our values. I just want to be clear. Tonight's the public hearing. That is only for school committee to listen. Tomorrow night, Thursday night, we will we'll be deliberating starting at six o'clock, and that's an right. open forum. Chad, good luck. You and Mary Skipper presenting that budget. I know. Thank you. I know everybody is rooting for the kids to go back in some way, shape, or form. Kerry Norman, good luck with it. I hope I hope the school committee does the right thing. So Thank unfortunately, you. we are out of time. I've got to say goodbye for today. Uh, thank you very much to both of you for joining us on Somerville Media Center Live. I'm Joe Lynch. Please stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time.